Hello, and welcome to Love's United Methodist Church. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And we are able to go to the house of the Lord in public again, finally. This is our second week of re-entry, you might say, into public worship, even though it is somewhat limited. Still not in the sanctuary. And I suspect that if you're watching this online, you may not have chosen to come to the worship service in the fellowship hall. But as a reminder, if you do choose to, that, to do that, we are worshiping in the fellowship hall only at this time at 1030 on Sunday mornings. We're grateful for the opportunity to do that and grateful for the opportunity to come together, even if in spirit only, uh, virtually. Let us now go to God in prayer as we prepare our hearts for this time of worship. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, for the silence of this moment, for the beauty of this day, for this chance that we might join our spirits together to worship you, we give you thanks. Quieten our busy minds. Let us focus on you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Join with me as we say together the words of the historic creed of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, we're going to be continuing in 1 Corinthians. If you remember last week, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 on All Saints Sunday. Next week, we will be looking at another 1 Corinthians passage. The week following, believe it or not, will be the last Sunday in the church year, the liturgical church year I'm speaking of. That is what we typically call Christ the King Sunday. We'll be looking at another Matthew passage then as we wrap up the year that we have spent a good bit of time in Matthew. But for today, we're looking at another 1 Corinthians passage. This is chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air. But I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O men of God, 
the church for you does wait. Her strength unequal to her task, rise up and make her great. Now this is a somewhat obscure text. Probably not one that jumps out at you as one of your favorites. It's likely not a go-to uh, for any particular reason. But there certainly is value in what Paul is teaching us in these short, simple words. He uses this analogy about running a race, preparing, competing, running for the ultimate prize. One of my favorite books on Christian spirituality is the classic book, Celebration of Discipline. Now, this is a book by Richard Foster, and it really is kind of that go-to book for spiritual growth. It's been around for, uh, I guess, a little more than 40 years now. And Richard Foster, who was a Quaker pastor, recently retired from public ministry just last year, if I'm not mistaken, maybe this year. At any rate, in this book, he explores the ideas of what it means to have disciplines, if you will what he calls disciplines, those things that help us grow in our relationship with God, that help us grow in our faith. It really is about preparing ourselves for a race, if you will, if we want to look at it in terms of, of Paul's words here this morning. In our own Methodist Wesleyan theology, we have the three simple rules we have, you've probably heard more in the past few months than ever before. Because Wesley taught us first, do no harm, then do good, and then stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. We've used this notion of no harm certainly a lot in these past few months in terms of, of our worship service and so forth in relation to COVID. Taking care of ourselves, taking care of others. First, we do no harm. Now, the third rule which we usually say is stay in love with God, is actually attend to the ordinances, attend to the ordinances that help us stay in love with God. And that's kind of a stodgy term, it seems, these days, attend to the ordinances. But ordinances, disciplines, practices, it's all the same thing. It is a matter of preparing ourselves to have a deeper relationship, to train ourselves by doing certain things that bring us into a closer relationship with Christ, to run for the ultimate prize. We attend to those ordinances. Now, in this passage, Paul is working feverishly at trying to get the early Corinthian church to understand what it is he's talking about. The church is young. It has no history or experience upon which to draw. And Paul is using every means possible to try to get them to, to see the beauty of a life lived in Christ, with Christ. So he is using this analogy of running a race. It's a race for an earthly, perishable prize. And he compares that to running for an imperishable prize prize, eternal life. I mentioned All Saints Sunday just a, a few moments ago, if you recall last week. We looked at another passage in this first Corinthians book, and Paul was talking about putting on imperishability. And here Paul is saying that eternal life, eternal life, which we spoke of last week as we remembered those who had died in the previous year, now he begins in the here and now. It's the here and now, not just the hereafter. I used to run a little, not a lot. I was never a super competitor or anything like that. I didn't run track or cross country in, in school or anything like that. I just ran because, well, it just kind of felt good to run. I just enjoyed getting into the, the rhythm the rhythm of breathing and moving and feeling the wind in my face. Well, I never ran fast enough to feel too much of it in my face, but you know what I mean. I was never particularly fast. I did run a few 5K and 10K races just for the enjoyment of doing it. 
Now, about 25 years ago or so, I had this feeling that I had been, uh, well, a bit too sedentary, shall we say. It was just a matter of going to work and coming home and going to work and coming home, and I hadn't really done anything to, to have enough physical activity, I didn't think. So I decided I'd start jogging again. That was just kind of a natural thing for me. And so I began, uh, sort of plodding along at first, not really paying attention to how fast I was running, just, just sort of doing it, working through the soreness of, of getting back into that routine of jogging. After a few weeks, I began to settle into my own rhythm. I used to get this rhythm of, of the way I would breathe and, and found my comfort zone of, of what made sense for me. And that was about an eight or an eight and a half minute mile. Nothing too blistering fast, that's for sure. That's not gonna win any races. But I wasn't looking to, to win any literal races, as it were. I was just found where my comfort zone was and it felt good to be able to move and do that sort of thing. Well, as a motivation, as a motivation to keep up my practice, or my discipline, if you will, attend to the ordinances, if you will, I decided I would sign up for a 5K race. I would need to prepare to get ready. It seemed like a good motivator for me. So I registered for what was then called the Brenner's Children's Classic, the Brenner Children's Classic. It began and ended there at the old Western Electric Building on it's now the BB&T building. I guess it's called something else now, isn't it? Truest BB&T, whatever. Anyway, they're on Renolda Road at Silas Creek. The day of the race came. It was late August. And this was a very popular race venue. I had no idea how popular really, but, but when I got there, there were runners of all stripes, young and old and competitive and not so competitive. And there were young kids and, and high school students and retirees. I will fully admit that I was not quite as prepared to run this race as I should have been. I mean, it was only 3.1 miles, I told myself. No big deal. I mean, I used to, operative word being used to, as in past tense, be able to run five consecutive six-minute miles, five miles and 30 minutes. Now, I know that's not a blistering speed either, but the point is, I could do that easily enough, so a simple 5K should be just a breeze. I can do that while I'm resting. I lied to myself. At any rate, the race began, and I found myself caught up in a group of runners. Well, they were faster than what I was accustomed to, but I was feeling good. The adrenaline was pumping. I was pounding the pavement. I hadn't found that rhythm, that comfort zone that I typically found at that eight to eight and a half minute mark, but I was still running and it was okay. Well, at the first split, you know, when they call out the times at the mile markers, there at that first split, I could hear the times being called out as I was approaching. And the, the person on the, the sidelines there calling out the times was saying six minutes and 58 seconds, seven minutes. Seven minutes, two seconds as I ran right by. Oh man, that is too fast for me, I remember thinking. But I was feeling good. And I foolishly kept up that pace. You'd think I would have backed off. No. Mile two was just a few seconds slower. Not a whole lot, a few seconds slower. Seven minutes and 20 seconds, I remember the time being called out. I must be better than I thought I was, I remember thinking. I've got this. Now, the first two miles, there is some downhill, some uphill, some flat. Uh, you know, it was really a good mix for a short race like that. A good mix of downhill, uphill, some flat. And at the beginning of the third mile, now remember the second mile, I'm still going at a pretty good pace for me. I realize that's not gonna win any races on the true competitors, but for me, that was a pretty good clip. The beginning of the third mile is a little downhill, and then it changes. It's all uphill after you cross over where Silas Creek area is there on Renolda Road, there at the entrance of Wake Forest. Now, when driving up Renola Road, as I have done hundreds, perhaps even thousands of times in my life across the years, 
You know, that hill doesn't really seem all that steep or long. But running it, when my pace was way too fast for what I had trained for, well, you know, that hill is a whole lot steeper and a whole lot longer than you might think. Halfway up that hill, I was done for. I mean, I was done for. I couldn't take, literally, I could not take another step. I was winded, gasping for air. My legs were like jello. I was bent over, holding onto my knees, trying to breathe. And people were running by me, little kids running right by me, older people just, just blazing right by me. Now, I'm not the only one who just sort of stopped there on that hill and couldn't breathe. There were a few others just like me trying our best just to be able to gasp for the next breath. Finally, after a, a minute or two, I was able to force myself to take a step and then another and then another. When I finally got close to the finish line, it, it, the hill kind of tops off and then you go in the parking lot right there in the kind of a level grade. I was able to have some semblance of a jogging sort of fashion as I crossed the finish line. You know, there's something really embarrassing about having to walk across a finish line with all these people standing around and watching you finish. Really, my time wasn't all that bad for me since the first two miles were much faster than they should have been. The time was probably about what my average would have been had I run it, but I was just nearly collapsed as I finished. Basically, I had not trained properly. I was caught up in a pace that took me out of my rhythm. I didn't run my race. I didn't run in such a way that I might uh, win the prize, that's for sure. In fact, I simply wasn't prepared to run any sort of race at that pace. I wasn't going to win any prize, perishable or imperishable, though for a moment I was beginning to wonder about the imperishable part. Paul, in using this analogy about racing, well, you know, what's he talking about, really? It's important to put this passage, just as it is any passage we read, in context. We have to read it in the context in which it was written in order for us to fully grasp, to understand what it is he is telling us. The church at Corinth is a young church, and they were struggling mightily. This letter was written probably around, experts date this around 55 AD, and we think about that. This is only 20 to 25 years after the life, crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. So these early converts to the faith, and they were mostly Gentiles, had not grown up steeped in a faith tradition. They had nothing to lean on. They were immature believers. Now, we're fortunate. We're fortunate in that we have a 2,000-year history upon which to draw. And here at Loves, here at Loves in this local church, we have a 229-year history upon which to draw. We, we can look at past generations and we can gain some sense of what it means to live a life in Christ. And Paul is trying to help these early believers to understand, to understand their theology, what it means to live together, what it means to live together as the body of Christ. There were arguments in the early church. There was tension. There were fractures. There were splinters. Does any of this sound vaguely familiar? Paul had his hands full in trying to teach them the way of Christ. The Jesus way. Living in peace with each other was something foreign to them. They had been accustomed to living a life of tension and arguments over petty things. And it was a generational problem. And living peacefully, working together for the cause of Christ, well, it was a new and foreign concept to them. Preparing themselves for the long race, keeping their eyes on the prize, you might say, wasn't really even in their realm of thought. 
And so Paul, Paul is attempting to teach them what it means, what it means to live with their eyes on an imperishable prize, to live a life with Christ. That is a life with Christ in the here and now as well as the hereafter. The here and now as well as the hereafter. And Paul is, the beauty of the scripture is that Paul is attempting to teach us that as well. And we do that, he says, by training. By attending to those things that enable us to grow spiritually. Without training, we can be left winded. Gasping for air, unprepared to run our race. Without training, we sometimes give up, wondering what life in the church is even all about. Without training, we sometimes end up in a world of tension or turmoil or drama over insignificant things in church life. I've seen it played out over and over and over across the years. We often hear about someone having a conversion experience and becoming a new Christian. Now, that's a wonderful thing. That's something to celebrate. But, you know, there's more. There's more to being a Christian than just a conversion experience. There's a great quote by the late theologian Charles Spurgeon, which says, Being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. And so we train. We train, we follow certain practices, we put ourselves in places where we can be attuned to the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. Now when reading this passage, when reading this passage, it would be really easy to go directly to this thought of our race being just as a way of preparing to get to heaven. As if life in the hereafter is the only prize. As if the only thing waiting for us at the end of life was heaven only and, and not even thinking about our earthly journey. Now certainly we think of life after death. We certainly spoke to that last week on All Saints Sunday. But just like there is more to life than what exists in our earthly realm, which we spoke of last Sunday. There certainly is more to life than simply looking forward to life after death. We do not run aimlessly, Paul says. We do not shadow box or, or beat the air with, with no focus, no focus on what it is that we're doing. We're not running just to get to the prize at the end and that's it. Like that's all there is, imperishable though it may be. Part of the beauty, and I think this is what we miss so much of the time, part of the beauty of running the race is in fact the training, if you want to put it that way, to get there. Part of the beauty of striving toward the imperishable goal, the imperishable goal of, of life after death, is in fact living with Jesus in the here and now living the way Jesus taught in the here and now. As I've heard it put before, Christianity is not just a series of ideas to be held in the mind, analyzed in the classroom, talked about in the sanctuary, or defended in the marketplace. It is above all else a life to be lived. It is above all else a life to be lived. We live that life by making the decision to live for Christ. We run with a purpose, and we do that by training. By training, if you will, like the athlete who exercises self-control and discipline in all things. I mean, think about a multi-million dollar sports figure. Those folks who are at the top of their game, those athletes that are just the, the best of the best, the elite, if you will, and still, what do you see? On game day, what do you see? You see them warming up, going over the basic fundamentals, running plays or shooting free throws or taking batting practice. It is doing those things with intentionality, running with a purpose, 
following the practices that put them where they are to begin with. Now, sure, there is natural talent with that as well. No matter how much practice I take, I'm never going to be uh, and never would have been this blazing runner or, a, or an esteemed athlete of any sort. There's natural talent, but there's also the idea, there's also the idea of getting better at their trade. It's like musicians. There is natural God-given talent, but it also takes hard work and practice. It takes discipline. It takes discipline to keep our eyes on the prize. It takes dedication to be prepared for the race. We don't prepare with just dreams of life in the hereafter. We live it in the here and now. We live it in the here and now, running the race for the imperishable prize by staying focused on that prize, that reward which is life with Jesus now and later. It is the both and. It is the already but not yet. It is heaven and earth overlapping. It is helping usher in the kingdom of God by the way we live our lives now as we prepare for the race every day. We can lose sight of this as individuals. We can lose sight of this as a church if we're not prepared to run the race that is set before us. So I want to ask you a question. Is there some area of your life that needs more discipline? I think if we're honest, we could all say yes. And by discipline, of course, I'm, I mean the disciplines. Prayer, study, stewardship, Worship, is there some area where our spiritual disciplines can be improved upon? This is not a guilt trip. It's just a question for us to wrestle with, to ponder. If we lose sight of the prize that Paul speaks of, we can find ourselves not as prepared to run the race as we should be. We can find ourselves hitting that steep hill and halfway through that third mile, running completely out of steam. And like gasping for breath with uh, trying to stand there on wobbly legs that won't even move. I'm here to tell you that's uncomfortable. It's even painful. But because of who Christ is and the grace poured out on us, even when things may be a bit rocky, and when we are unprepared for the race, we have the opportunity to keep training, to, to get it right, to keep our eyes on the prize, to strive for the imperishable wreath. It is life with Christ, and it is life with Christ in the here and now as well as in the hereafter. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us to come into your presence, to train, to learn to live the Jesus way. One of these ways is just being here in worship with you on Sundays, attending to those things that help us draw closer to you. Give us that strength, dear Lord, that we might run the race with the prize in mind. Life with you in the here and now as well as the hereafter. Amen. Thy grace has made us strong, 
And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. Lead on, O King Eternal, we follow not with fears, for gladness breaks like morning where'er thy face appears. Thy cross is lifted o'er us, we journey in its light. The crown awaits the conquest, lead on, O God of might. As we come to our time of offering, that is one of those ordinances we attend to, that regular giving, that giving up control, if you will. We thank you for your tithes and your offerings and your continued support of the church. you to pray with me now our prayer of confession the words will be on your screen say these words with me out loud as we uh, go into then our pastoral prayer most merciful God we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone we have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Let us continue now to be in an attitude of prayer as we pray together. Gracious God, for this beautiful day, we give you thanks. For this time of quiet, of being together, whether we're together physically in the fellowship hall for worship or together in spirit. We thank you for the church, Lord. Help us be the people you've called us to be in the church and to attend to those ordinances, to run with our eyes on the prize. By ourselves, we often fail finding ourselves in the middle of that third mile gasping for air. But we know, dear Lord, that with you we also have grace and mercy and the opportunity to be the people you've called us to be. So thank you, O oh God. Thank you for this beautiful time of year as we approach Thanksgiving and soon-to-be Advent. And it has been a difficult year, but we have so many things to be thankful for as well. We thank you for our country. And it has been a vitriolic, sometimes violent, certainly broken 
season that we've been in. But we also pray for healing and give you thanks for this great country. We will be approaching Veterans Day. We thank you for all those who have served and continue to serve. We pray for our leaders, all of our leaders in our country, in our communities, and in our churches, that we might all have the strength to do what it is we're called to do. All these things, Lord, we lift up in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.